Uh, hello, uh, I'm Peter Henderson. I'm the lead developer on the Reonomy Developer Portal. Uh, before I get started, here's some information about Reonomy. We're based in New York. We provide comprehensive data on every commercial real estate property in the United States. We have a web app our customers use to get property information. And we also have an API our customers use to access our data programmatically. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on our property API and I'll start with a quick demo. Within the API, the post search summaries endpoint is the place, the endpoint we use to locate properties based on search criteria. Uh, below the endpoint name, is a section containing information about the endpoint that can include diagrams, videos, or anything else that might be helpful. I'll explain shortly how it's combined with the auto-generated portions. The parameters section is auto-generated from the spec. Uh, this tree is rendered using the D3 data visualization library, and I'll get into this later. Clicking a parameter, opens up the query builder. This lets you build requests interactively. And as you build your query, a ready to run code sample is displayed on the right with multiple languages available. Another option is to select one of our pre-filled examples, which you can then modify. Now, if you've entered your access token, which I have, you can run the query directly from the portal. So down below on the right is the response component, which displays the actual response. Uh, clicking any attribute displays its details in a pop-up. The response from this endpoint doesn't include much information about properties other than the ID and the geolocation. If you click the IDs tab, uh, you can then copy the IDs and you can paste them into our uh, bulk retrieval endpoint. This time when I run the request, I get back the actual data for each of those matching properties. So here are the topics I'll touch on today. Uh, it's a lot to cover, so let's get started with how we combine content that's auto-generated from our API spec with handwritten content. Uh, we use OpenAPI, and on the left is a small portion of the post search summaries uh, definition. Item one is the endpoint path. Item two shows the reference to the request body component and item three is the reference to the response component. When you expand an endpoint, our API spec parser locates the component names in the spec and follows the nested ref links to create a single internal object for that endpoint. And we'll look at the data structure shortly. The handwritten content comes from a separate endpoint MBX file that we'll look at next. The site will build just fine without these files. But this is how authors can supplement what's in the spec. Uh, MDX is a combination of Markdown and JSX, where JSX is React's extension to JavaScript. Uh, we use Gatsby to build the site. And while MDX isn't unique to Gatsby, uh, Gatsby does provide great support through the MDX plugin. The top portion on the left, uh, A, is the endpoints overview section. Left call and right call are custom React layout components and any markdown supplied to those components is transformed by the MDX plugin to a JSX component for rendering. The rest of the file defines content to merge with the spec. For example, if there's a, an attribute description here, like item B, it will override the one in the spec. If there are attributes that aren't valid for external users, like item C, we can hide them by setting the description to exclude. Uh, 
We also define the initial example, D, and those selectable examples that I showed you earlier, E, in this section. Some of our request and response schemas are deeply nested, and I was frustrated with all the clicking I had to do to view nested attributes. The solution I came up with is to render the schemas as D3 trees. Now, on the left is an example of a traditional nested accordion structure you'll often see used for nested objects. Now, you click to expand the child parameters at each level, and as you expand, the page gets longer and longer. On the right is a similar nested object rendered using D3, and there's no clicking to view the child attributes. Additionally, all the attributes, even the most deeply nested, are searchable using command F. Next, I'll show you how we transform the spec into a data structure we can render using D3. Uh, the schema visualizations are based on the indented tree sample in the D3 gallery. Uh, on the right is the data structure used to generate this tree. It's a nested hierarchy where each object has a name and an array of children. This is quite close to the structure of an open API spec where each component has a name and a list of properties, each of which can be another component. Here's how we transform the spec. Uh, item one is the spec for the company component. This component has 15 properties, one of which is a list of addresses, that's item two. Following the ref takes you to the address component, which is item three, and this has 10 properties. Transformation A turns the company properties into an array of 15 child objects, and B turns the address properties into an array of 10 child objects. For each child, you can see the attributes from the spec shown as C. The structure now matches the one used by D3. I showed the query builder in the demo. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, since the data on each D3 node has everything from the spec for that attribute, when you click the node, we can pass that information to a custom popover. When you interact with the query builder, you're updating an instance of a request model class that's created for each endpoint, that's B in the code. In step one, we're updating the request body with the attribute and value from the query builder. Uh, the code generator then updates the sample code. And when you click run, we make an AJAX request using the model settings and display the response in the response component. Uh, I'll show you how we integrate those same interactive components into our guide pages. Uh, guide pages are intended to introduce new users to our API. Uh, since the number of attributes uh, can be overwhelming at first, guide pages can display just a subset to demo a specific use case. Uh, here we show how to search for properties by asset type. Uh, we write our guide pages using MDX. Uh, you, you can see the descriptive content, uh, one, uh, which is written in Markdown uh, within the React layout components we looked at earlier. Uh, code example, uh, which is number two, is a custom React component that wraps the same query builder and request components that we saw earlier. Uh, we're passing to it a param list with just the parameters we want to display. Uh, and here's the end result again showing the transform markdown along with the query builder and request components, this time within the code example component. Uh, finally, I'd like to show you what's possible once your API spec is transformed into something you can pass to D3. Uh, on the left is another sample from the D3 gallery, and on the right is a version of the same radial tree showing the response schema for our get endpoint. It's color coded based on the detail type. So uh, mortgage information, tax information, et cetera. And uh, that concludes my presentation. So thank you. So thank you for, uh, for the technical tour. Um, I hope that I'm not going to ask something that I shouldn't, but here we go. Um, this D3 model, uh, that was very, very fascinating for me. And I would like to ask, um, did you, do outside usability and accessibility testing on it? And, and how did you do that? Or, or you saw other people using it and that was enough uh, convincing that you implemented it? 
No, as far as I know, this is a, a fairly novel uh, use of D3. Uh, for, for, the, for those interactive request trees that, uh, that, that we saw, uh, in a, a previous implementation used the nested accordion structure. And so we had the opportunity to, to do some informal A-B testing between the, the old implementation and the new. It was, uh, it was no more than, uh, than just a slack ball within our engineering department, basically asking, which one do you prefer? Mm -hmm. And people were uh, unanimous in preferring the new design. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently, uh, we're in the process of transitioning from our uh, V2 API to, to V3. Uh, so I rolled out the, the new implementation first for uh, V3, uh, which was still internal only at the time. Uh, so that gave us the opportunity to sort of field test it and get some feedback from from actual uh, from, from users. And when the feedback was positive, uh, we went back and retrofitted the, the V2 docs. Uh, and the, yeah, the design and implementation continues to evolve. Uh, if anyone else is uh, using D3 in this way, uh, please drop me a note because I, I'd love to uh, compare notes and talk about how to make the implementation uh, more accessible. Uh, it feels a bit like unexplored territory, so it would be nice to have some uh, community collaboration. And are there other um, less uh, often used uh, techniques or, or tools in API docs that you have your eyes on that you're thinking about implementing? Well, uh, our site is really more of uh, an interactive uh, API doc site than, than a fully fledged uh, developer portal. Uh, we have a few of what you might call admin features, like uh, we have the ability to check your API credit usage, but we don't have uh, self-serve onboarding, trial API key generation, key rotation, integrated support, community engagement, things like that. Uh, I really love the uh, role-specific content and the admin console features that we saw earlier. And uh, that's already giving me uh, ideas. Uh, that's one of the things I love about this conference uh, and all the collaborative idea sharing that takes place. Uh, at Reanimate, we still have a relatively small number of API and data solutions customers. So there's a lot of handholding that takes place to mm -hmm. onboard new customers. And going forward, uh, we plan to expand the scope of the portal and add more of those uh, admin type features uh, to make it more of an end-to-end -end self serve experience. Uh, but we have a lot to do, but specifically in the short term, uh, a couple of the things that we've planned are uh, well first you may have noticed that there's no uh, login button on the site we let you enter your api access token and we use that uh, to know what features are enabled for your account and so you can uh, make interactive requests uh, we, we then use that information dis to display content according to your subscription level uh, but we we plan to add integrated authentication using the same security backend that our web app uses. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. And questions from the audience. Um, you were showing on a slide, where can I find more information on D3 modeling, but maybe it wasn't legible. Um, where is uh, D3 modeling housed? Uh, there's, uh, if you go to d3.org, you can find everything that you ever wanted to know about D3 and, uh, and more. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a wealth of uh, information, and and the highlight for me is the uh, is it, they call it the observable D three gallery, uh, which is uh, I showed a, a couple of examples of D uh, three renderings that were implemented on the D three gallery, and the nice thing about that site is uh, that the code is there. You can you can look at it. You, you see the you see the rendered output, and uh, but but best of all, you can actually go in and inter update the code yourself on their site, and uh, the, and the renderings will uh, will be updated uh, for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I began to explore use of D three, uh, that was how I uh, really took my first steps. Uh, I, I found. Uh, a rendering that was that was close to something I felt uh, might be helpful, uh, and then began to uh, explore uh, 
putting our uh, API spec data into into their uh, into the data node on, on the interactive D three page and uh, looking at the output. Mm -hmm. How is the writer experience, um, the authoring experience? Uh, what tools do you use to write the content and to publish it? Yeah, so as uh, as I showed in the demo, uh, the platform code is very tightly integrated with the, with the written content. I showed a sample MBX file where you have Markdown combined with React JSX. And uh, from that, it's, it's clear that you need at least some basic understanding of uh, some knowledge of JavaScript and how to work in a code repo before going into those files to make changes, even just uh, to the markdown. You know, it's quite easy to break the page if you introduce something that's not 100% syntactically correct. And you also need to be set up as a developer and know about Git commands and, and, and so on. Uh, so I remember seeing presentations at earlier API docs uh, conferences where people talked about having a clear line of separation mm -hmm. between content and platform code. Mm -hmm. So it got me thinking about how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing I did recently was to build a proof of concept for a content management system integration where the CMS would be the repository for our FAQ knowledge base. And we pull the content into the uh, developer portal using the uh, CMS uh, API. So the idea is that anyone, regardless of their level of comfort working in a code repo, can use the, the content management systems, admin UI and editor to create or edit uh, FAQ articles. And they just show up in the dev portal in a way that you can uh, browse and search. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we already use a product called Intercom at Rianme for web app support. So uh, using Intercom seems like an obvious place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly a headless CMS, but it has an article repository and an API that you can use to, to pull articles in. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the, the realized version of that, hopefully at the next API the Docs conference, which is hopefully live, finally. <laughs> um, and um, thank you very much.